Thanks everyone for being here once again. I'm Alex Yarkin from Brown University, economics PhD candidate. And um, today I'm gonna talk about learning from the origins. That's the paper I've been working quite a while and I'm very curious to know what you think. I think it's a very topical research because, um, well, basically because we live in times of both increasing migration and increasing international connectivity. And well, you will see in a minute why uh, how I think this learning from the origins may operate. Well, without any further ado, uh, let me start. And uh, basically, in a nutshell, this paper speaks to this very broad question about where preferences and attitudes come from. Okay, and we as economists and social scientists, we we tend to think, we used to think about at least two or three channels, right? First of all, preferences and attitudes can be transmitted vertically within the family. Right, and there is a lot of evidence on that. Then there is also evidence on local exposure, local networks, local peer effects, your neighborhoods, your schools, right, and so on. And finally, of course, especially in the sensitive years and the formative years, it was shown that exposure to shocks, exposure to salient events matters. But we often talk about local exposures, right? However, in the modern world, even as I was saying, that is getting increasingly globalized, increasingly interconnected in terms of information flows now. Everything is online, right? All the media sources, all your friends, even your family members might be online, and so on. So basically, who are our peers? Especially if we move cross-country, how do we allocate our attention, okay? Do we get consumed by the local events and attitudes, or do we still care? And are we still influenced by attitudes from abroad? Okay, so which events do we pay attention to? Okay, and basically in this paper, the main question that I ask is how perceptive public attitudes are to opinions coming from abroad. Okay, an immigration network comes very naturally here because, well, immigrants tend to look back over the shoulder on the places that were important and maybe still are important to them. Okay, so basically the question becomes do immigrants learn from the origin? All right, is there this sort of spillover effect from the country in which you're born, or even your parents were born if you're a second generation immigrant. But maybe these events and opinions still transmit to you in your new place of uh, new place where you live. Okay. And basically, maybe an even more important question is can these migration networks propagate changing political ide ideology following important events? Right. So something happened far away, but maybe because of these migration networks, political repercussions of this event can be felt in very distant places. And why do we care? Well, because today Im immigrants, especially if we combine first and second generation immigrants, they constitute more than 25, 30% in many developed countries, okay? And um, because of these the dynamics of opinions and thoughts of immigrants and their children, they matter for locals, they matter for voting oftentimes and for social cohesion more broadly. Um, I also see something in the chat. Do I have to? No, okay. I will respond. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll let you know when there's a question. Okay. Yeah, okay. So this is basically the, the motivation of this paper. All right, and uh, one can think of several well-known examples, right? So one would be, for example, example of uh, this, this case of Hungary, where basically Hungarian government and Mr. Orban in particular was basically trying to affect how Hungarian diaspora spread across Europe, uh, voted for uh, basically anti-immigration parties and anti-immigration initiatives, all right? Another salient case is Russian diaspora in Germany, uh, which basically where we see how obviously over the last, last you know, 10, 15 years, anti-Western attitudes in Russia were and are on the rise. And we see a very similar dynamics in Russian diaspora living in Germany and know that this diaspora is there for many years there. Most of them are very well integrated in the whole society. And still, you know, if certain political attitudes change at the origin, it seems like there is this spillover effect to diaspora, okay? These are just, of course, just two cases, all right? So what I do in this paper is that I consider a shock that can basically trigger this sort of social learning from the origin, all right? So I use origin cross time variation in country exposure to the European refugee crisis. I will speak more about how I, how I measure this. And I test whether basically origin country exposure to which the diasporas are not directly 
exposed, but the origin countries are exposed. Whether this origin country exposure affects these groups of immigrants living abroad, whether it affects their attention, I measure this via Google Trends. So what do they care about, what they Google online, whether it affects their uh, opposition towards non-Europeans as measured, let's say, via European social survey, and whether it affects their voting behavior, okay? Whether you vote for local conservative parties when your origin country gets certain exposure, okay? And then I will try to see whether basically the transmission of attitudes between populations can actually explain these effects of the crisis, okay? So this is basically the... I don't think we'll have time in this relatively short presentation, but if we do, I will also show that this, this idea of spillovers following salient events, that it actually extends to other shocks and other non-European contexts. In particular, other shocks like same-sex marriage laws, for example. Very salient event in a given country, I will show it has repercussions abroad. Okay. Then, of course, if we find that there is this sort of spillover effect, this sort of co-movement, then we may ask why. That, what is going on? Why would people living far away from their homeland, why would they update their own attitudes or behavior? Okay. There could be two types of explanations. One is the preference-based explanation, where basically either because of identity, that you know you don't want to feel too different from the group you identify with, or because of some sort of deep ingrained cultural similarity, meaning that same origin, same shared history, forces you react in the same way to selling. I will show that this is unlikely to be the full story because there is actually evidence for communication. Okay? And well, the second explanation is basically information-based, communication-based. Okay? And here again, we can, we can have two stories, right? One could be like a network story where basically you have, let's say, your family or friends still at the origin. And uh, for some reason, if, let's say, uh, your aunt or your mother sees refugees and tells you how terrible that is, uh, you tend to believe it and update your own. Right? Or it can be not a private network, but like a public, let's say, media series, right? So you still consume origin country media, and this forces you to, you know, move in the same direction as your country of origin. Uh, this second channel, it also implies, by the way, that you still have a disproportionate attention to your country of origin, but the explanation is slightly, slightly different. And it's not so simple to distinguish this. Uh, I'm still working on that, but we can discuss this later on. Okay, and uh, you know, again, since this is a short presentation, I want to give this preview before we go into details because you never know uh, where the time runs out. And so, the cur currently paper consists of two two parts. The first part is this uh, sort of uh, broad broad patterns thing where I document basically that forget for a second about the refugee crisis at all. I look at various topics, various political and social issues, and I document the co-movement. Basically, countries of origin and immigrants from this country living elsewhere, they co-move in their political attitudes, in a broad spectrum of attitudes, okay? Uh, they co-move in what they pay attention to, and they co-move in what issues they find salient, okay? Moreover, this co-movement is stronger for immigrants who are less integrated into the new society. I can measure this as citizenship, as language use, length of residence, and so on. And importantly, to distinguish it be, uh, between these various transmission channels or explanations, I show that communication actually plays a role. Okay, so there is suggestive evidence that, for example, if parts of your family are still abroad at the origin, then communication is stronger and spillovers are stronger. Okay. Or, for example, if your region in which you currently live is connected via social media to your country of origin, then again, uh, spillover is strong. Okay. So apparently, it's not about like cultural similarity that, let's say, all Russians, I'm, I'm of Russian origin, uh, let's say all Russians react in the same way to war in Ukraine. Not necessarily. Okay. Maybe there is uh, communication. Okay. Although both, both, both things can be going on. And then basically to improve on the identification and understanding of these mechanisms, I zoom into the refugee crisis case, okay? Why do I do this? Well, because it gives me large variation in exposure to a very salient shock, okay? To a very discussed event. 
and also because currently the literature shows that there are direct effects of the refugee crisis. And this paper can show that maybe such salient events can also have a contagion effects beyond local, local exposure. Okay. And I will use this variation in exposure across origin countries in years, exposure to basically asylum seekers and refugees, and show that spillovers activate for years and origins with strongest exposure. Okay. And apparently the way that it works, and I can show it with the data, as well, this is a little bit more suggestive that once the shock hits the origin, it activates attention from abroad. I can measure this via Google Trends data, for example. And then people learn or update information from like-minded groups. Okay, and this is like the homophily effect that I explained. That basically, let's say, if I'm a Russian living in the US, I do not just co move with the Russian average, okay? I find the like-minded Russian at the origin, probably my friends or family members, and I move in the same direction as they move. So I, oh, yeah, basically. Okay, and then again, I don't think we'll have time today. I also try to generalize these results beyond the refugee crisis case, namely looking at the staggered passage of same-sex marriage laws, and I find similar patterns of spillovers, and I also find spillovers from Europe to the US. So uh, it's a quite, quite general phenomenon. Alex, just one quick question. So when you refer origin countries, you're treating like as one unit, or is you have variation within countries? There is, of course, variation within countries. The issue is that I don't have region of origin. So I cannot match people to, at least in the main data set that I currently use, like the GSS, ESS, Eurobarometer. In these data sets, you don't have regions of origin. So, but I can check, for example, whether people react, let's say if they come from Germany, and I know that, whether they react to regions more strongly exposed or regions in the outskirts of the crisis in Germany. This I could. Japanese. Yes, another thing you could do is just match in terms of observables, like you want the thing similar to your peers in terms of age, education, or other characteristics. This I do in the homophily analysis here. Okay, yes. okay, great, yes, great. And it's really problematic because I cannot even see who is speaking. Is there no way to bring the video? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm Lucas. <laughs> is you, you should put it in the speaker, but it's it's fine, it's fine. I can. All right, all right. Just go on, and then we can see. Yep. Okay. All right. So this is the results. I think they contribute uh, quite nicely to this to this literature on basically persistence and change of preferences and attitudes. There is a large literature that already have credibly documented that you know there is vertical transmission plus local networks and local shocks matter. What this paper shows is that you know, wait a minute in a, such an interconnected world, maybe the distant events and opinions matter as well. And I show like that. Immigration not network in particular can can facilitate this transmission from distant places. Okay, then of course the very closely related literature on this diffusion of norms and ideas. And usually in this literature we we see that like if population is moves, it gets exposed to let's say destination attitudes and slowly converges to this kind of fixed fixed cultural stock or fixed political stock. Okay, this paper in contrast shows changes. Right, so if in a certain place there is a evolution of certain attitudes or beliefs, this change can actually spill over abroad, okay? And of course, there is a more kind of specific literature on immigration refugees showing that they affect local populations, local political social dynamics. And what this paper shows is that the effects of such salient events, they can extend beyond, uh, beyond local borders, okay? All right, so if there are now questions about the broader things that we just discussed. If there are, let me know. If not, I will go into the details. Seems like it's all clear now. Very well. So uh, the way it looks, I don't think we'll have time to, for extensions if we're lucky for the mechanism. So I'll first show some broad regularities, which are the first part of the paper, and then I will go into the refugee crisis case. Okay. And uh, the other things are in principle in the paper on my website, although it's still um, actively updated. Okay, so regarding broad patterns, okay, uh, we'll focus today on the European Social Survey data for the sake of time. It allows me to track the evolution of political attitudes, voting behaviors, and intention 
And important, they can match people to their countries of origin. Okay. To measure attention and connectedness to the origins, I can use a Google Trends and Facebook data. Okay. And also local ancestral composition. Okay. Uh, this is just some summary statistics. To important thing from here are these three things. So the average length of residence for first generation immigrants is 30 years in my sample. So it's not like some commuters or recent migrants who obviously are basically never moved, really. Okay. These are really populations that are established in these new communities. And still, I will show you that this there are these very large spillovers. Okay, 70% are citizens. 37% are second gen migrants. Okay. And um, basically, this is just an illustration of how variation produced by the Re European refugee crisis, how, sorry, how large it is. Okay. So, roughly between round six and seven, European refugee crisis begins. Okay. And we see that certain countries like Hungary, for example, they massively increase their opposition to non-Europeans. Okay. The same thing was happening more or less in let's say Italy, in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Greece, okay, and in some other countries. In other countries, in contrast, in countries that were more like destination for these asylum seekers, like for example, like UK, like Belgium, to a less extent Germany and Netherlands and some other countries, France, in these countries attitudes tended to actually improve over. Okay, so more humanitarian approach, if you wish. So basically, the bottom line is that there is large variation in uh, exposure to this crisis. And interestingly enough, for these same four countries, we see that, you know, if at the origin, for example, in UK, I'm currently in UK, uh, attitudes improve after the refugee crisis, we see that the same is happening among uh, the expats from UK living elsewhere. If attitudes in Hungary deteriorate, we see that the same is happening in the Hungarian diaspora abroad, okay? In Belgium, first deteriorate, then improve, okay? So there is very close movement. And okay, it's not for all countries that close, but let's test, right? How close it is across countries. Well, to do that, I will, in this first part of the paper, estimate this very simple uh, co-movement coefficient beta. So I will ask, let's say, what is your opposition to non-Europeans? To a given first or second generation immigrant from Germany. Okay. I will measure what is the average attitudes in Germany and how they change over. Time. And I will try to see whether there is a co-movement. Okay. And how strong it is. Importantly, I will account for origin fixed effect, which means that I basically I identify from changes. So if attitudes in Germany increase, I ask whether they increase among the German experts. Okay. And I will also partial out all the local dynamics. So, for example, if a German immigrant, first or second generation, lives in Spain, okay, I will basically kill all local Spanish dynamics, okay, because you know local attitudes can also change, or local media coverage, or local economics can change during the crisis, okay, and maybe affect attitudes of everyone in this country. Okay? So, I will try to separate these effects and partial them out. So, what do we see? We see a very strong co-movement coefficients around point depending on the specifications, okay? Uh, so basically for every unit of change in the origin, you know, one unit increase, let's say it was case of the Hungary more or less throughout the last five, seven years, change in Hungary transmits, one unit of change in Hungary transmits into 0.25 units of change among, let's say, Hungarians in Spain, okay? Um, local changes matter a lot as well, well, because they are local, Okay, but once I partial them out completely, including this very flexible set of local cross time fixed effects, we see that origin influence is still there. Okay, it is still there with even with regional fixed effects, sub regional, and even for the second generation immigrants. Okay, so we see that there is spillover to first generation. We see that it is weaker for second generation immigrants, but not even much weaker, okay? not even significantly weaker. All right. So this is just a broad pattern. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily claim that it's somehow driven by the crisis or something like that. This is just a movement on average across all years and countries. Okay. Importantly, such movements coefficients are observed for various political attitudes. Okay. Like for example, support for EU unification, very strong movement. 
opposition to LGBT rights, very strong movement, trust in European institutions, and so on, but not for other attitudes. Okay? Uh, so this is a general and quite broad pattern, this sort of co-movement between origins and diasporas. Okay? Same co-movements in attention. Okay, so this, uh, I look at basically what people Google and whether they care about refugees, basically, whether they Google something related to refugees. And let's say on the left, the black line measures uh, Fluchtlinge, meaning German word for refugees and various searches with it in Germany. Okay, and on the right, in German language, but coming from abroad, let's say from France or from Spain or from the US. Okay, and we see that basically there is an almost perfect movement in interest to this topic, right? Same for Hungary, Russia, and other countries. Okay? This is just illustration again. All right. And finally, in this in this first part, I also show that if people blend in more in their destination countries, like say if they get citizenship or they reside, uh, reside longer, especially for citizenship, there is a very strong decrease in the extent of this spillover coefficient. Okay. Or for example, if you still speak your origin country, country language, then in contrast, you receive a stronger spillover. Okay? If you're more interested in politics or more educated, you, you receive a slightly stronger spillover and so on. So it looks like attention actually plays a role. You know? If you're more integrated, attention to the origin. Okay? So this is uh, one thing. And I also document that there are several transmission channels because you know, it takes time to explain every particular mechanism. If we have time, we'll talk about this uh, in the mechanism section, okay? But one example would be that, for example, I can look at the family composition of migrant households. And what I see is that, for example, if your parents are still at the origins, not locally, then the spillover is stronger, suggesting that there is communication intra-family, okay? If you move with your entire household, or at least with the most significant kind of most of the closest parts of your household, then spillovers are weak. If you have like good Facebook connectedness to the origin, the spillovers are strong. Okay, so this is an evidence for communication channel. Actually, uh, that they actually matter. Okay, so this broad part documents these various movements and spillovers for a range of political issues, for attention and other things. Okay, social integration weakens the influence of the origins and so on. Can we? get closer to causality and mechanism. Okay. Well, to get there, I look at the refugee crisis. Piece. Why is this so important? Well, because it was a very salient and important event, but beyond this, because it was exogenous in terms of time, it was driven by you know political instability and wars in the Middle East mostly, and because there was a large variation in exposure across countries. Because if you, if you recall, basically, asylum seekers were mostly entering Europe through Italy and Greece, and then trying to reach Germany, Sweden, UK, and some other. So basically, certain countries like, say, Russia or Portugal, they were naturally left out of these migration routes. Okay? So it's very easy to kind of categorize countries into more or less exposed to this crisis. Okay? And what I do is that I measure exposure to the European refugee crisis, at the origin country cross time level. I look at applications. I use that illegal, illegal uh, how is it called? Irregular, irregular border crossings uh, from the IOM, from UNHCR. Okay? And then for robustness, I also look at how, what is like the attention basically to this event. Because in principle, it's not necessarily that if many refugees are passing through the country that people actually discuss this, right? Because we would expect that these spillovers are there if people actually care about these issues, right? So for robustness, I measure how much people care actually. Either the media coverage or self-reported issues. Are. Okay. So this is just an example of how for non-transit countries, what is the share of applications per uh, 1,000 people? And we see that in many countries like Austria, Belgium, Switzerland, Denmark, Hungary, Sweden, there are large spikes in 2015, okay? Netherlands, Norway, the same. But in other countries, like let's say Slovakia, Romania, uh, Romania, sorry, Portugal, Poland, uh, Latvia, Ireland, Spain, there is basically nothing. Okay, so this is, allows me to very easily classify countries in, you know, destination countries, so like treated by these uh, applications or not. Okay, and this is just an example to illustrate 
uh, the variation a bit zoomed in okay, for several for several countries. Note that, for example, Italy and Greece does not have many applications, right? Although we know that refugees were there. And well, basically, to, to measure this, I also look at the transit migration. Okay, so data on transit migration and International Organization for Migration allows one to measure how many refugees were passing through, how many asylum seekers were passing through a country. And again, we can see that, for example, Albania, uh, Bosnia, or Spain did not see many refugees passing through, okay? While Greece, Croatia, Italy, Hungary, Macedonia, and other countries were on these main transition routes, okay? Uh, so basically what I do in this part of the paper is that I code countries as treated or not treated by the crisis, depending on their exposure in 2015-2016, okay? And I test whether this origin country exposure affects the outcomes, okay? And uh, similar specifications, you know, with lags and leads would be not a different diff, but the event study. I think we all know how it works. And then basically to test whether actually attitudinal transmission explains this direct effect of the crisis, I will test whether uh, attitudinal spillover that we documented in the first part of the paper, whether this spillover intensifies during the crisis, okay? And whether it explains away this direct correlation, okay? And it, and it will, okay? So uh, the basic results, okay? As I was saying, I separate countries into two parts, okay? Treated by transit migration or treated as destination countries, as you know, where many refugees actually stayed and applied for asylum, okay? Uh, let's see what we have for the effects of these two types of exposure. So quite interestingly, if your origin country, as let's say Germany or Finland or Norway, uh, is strongly exposed to uh, asylum applications in per capita terms, we see that attitudes abroad improve, okay? So if you, let's say, compare a German immigrant living in Spain, non-affected country, to a, let's say, Russian immigrant living in Spain next door, we see that basically German immigrant after the crisis becomes more welcoming to non-European migration. Okay, as compared to this Russian, okay? However, if there is a Hungarian or Italian or Greek immigrant next door, okay? And they, their countries of origin were exposed to transit migration, okay? Which people usually don't like, and I will show you this in the data in the first place. We see that for this migrant from Hungary or Italy, he would actually become even more against migration after the crisis, okay? As compared to, let's say, Russian, or Portuguese immigrant next door, okay? And these two effects work together as well as separate, okay? And in the last two columns, what I do, this is maybe too much for a single table, but uh, sorry about that, is um, still thinking how to better present it. In the last two tables, two columns, sorry, what I do is that I limit the sample to all countries where I have good data on origin attitudes, okay? And what I do for, for example, the applications treatment, what I show is that once I control for origin country attitudinal dynamics, the way that we're doing the first part of the paper, that the lar large part of this effect, it is basically gone. Okay, so at least partly this direct effect of the refugee crisis at the origin, it operates through attitudinal transmission, through this spillover effect. Okay, and there is evidence for communication channels to actually prove that. Okay, all right. Uh, I do the same thing in the event study format and I don't see any pre-trends, okay? So this is distance in terms of years to the moment when the origin country gets exposed to the crisis. In this particular graph, it's the asylum applications exposure. And we see that basically once your country gets exposed, your country of origin, uh, your own attitudes improve, okay? So they become, so opposition towards non-Europeans goes down. And then it reverts back, but not entirely. Okay. All right. And again, this makes sense because, for example, if you look at origin countries which got this transition exposure, you see that in countries like Hungary, like Italy, like Bulgaria, to an extent Slovenia, 
see that attitudes deteriorated in these countries, okay? But in countries, in most of the countries that received actually many applications to stay, like Belgium, like uh, Switzerland, like Finland, not so much uh, Denmark, Norway, Netherlands, you see an improvement in attitudes, okay? So opposition goes down, okay? Not everywhere. For example, in Austria, it was not like that, okay? But on average, in this kind of application countries, attitudes actually improve over time. And we see the same for immigrants abroad. Okay. All right, sorry. Uh, all right. Okay, so this is like the main thing. Now to the fact whether, to the question whether attitudinal spillovers can actually explain uh, this effect. What I do in this table, which I promise is the last uh, I show you, and um, look at the first column, okay? So here, what I have is the pre-crisis period, all right? And we see that basically before the crisis, we do not see much of a spillover from the origin. So this is like how attitudes evolve for the origin. We do not see much of a spillover, okay? And countries to be affected in the future are no different in this regard. However, in the crisis and post-crisis periods, we see that there is no spillover from non-affected countries and a huge spillover of opposition to refugees from affected countries. And in the third column, when I, I combine these two things together, we see that the whole diff and diff coefficient, the whole spillover coefficient of 0.2 that we documented some time before, it comes from actually affected origins during the crisis. Okay. In the last column, what I do is that I simply omit destination countries. So for example, uh, where immigrants live to those that are not themselves exposed to the crisis. Okay, to basically alleviate the issue of correlated exposures. Okay, because if I look at the Austrian immigrant in Germany, well, both countries are exposed to the crisis. So this correlated exposure can create co-movement, right? But in, if I instead look at the Austrian immigrant in Portugal, okay, well, Portugal is not really exposed to the crisis. Okay, so it makes it clear that this uh, that the exposure effect comes actually from the origin, not from the local country. Okay. Alex, just to inform you that you have yep. about five minutes left. Yep, thank you. Um, I think we're almost done with the main part. Here just shows how this spillover coefficient intensifies in the years of the crisis. Okay, basically the same thing as here, just in the uh, br broken down by years. Okay. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, for this part, what I do is also like a bunch of robustness tests. Okay, for example, I can drop recent migrants to exclude the chance that these co movements and spillovers are driven by, you know, composition changes. That maybe people leave the origin because of the crisis or because they disagree with how, how the country reacts to the crisis. Okay, so I can exclude recent migrants and the results are intact. I can exclude various origin countries, smaller. Or larger. I can experiment with the definition of treatment. It does not really matter. Okay. Let me know if you have other concerns uh, beyond those uh, listed. Okay. Now uh, to the mechanisms, real fast. So first, what I do is that, like, basically, I try to see. So, if a given country is exposed to the crisis, why would people abroad somehow react to this? Right. So the first question is that. Do they actually care about the origin country events, right? And to care to, to test this, I basically look at the Google Trends data in various languages. All right. So I can look at the searches, for example, just an illustration for German refugee word, which is Flüchtlinge. Okay. The black line is the search for terms with this word in Germany, in German. Okay. And the red line is the searches for this thing in German coming from outside of Germany, okay? And also in the exercise, I do the same in German coming from non-affected countries, like from Portugal or from Russia, not from Netherlands, for example, okay? And we see that basically, irrespective of the specification, what, what we will see is this very strong movement in attention, okay? So when uh, Angela Merkel makes her famous speech, there is a spike in surges. When there are, uh, Köln uh, sexual assaults in the January of 2016, there is a spike in searches in attention, both at the origins and from abroad. Okay, so people care, okay, what is what is happening there. Um, 
they care more if it is actually their origin country. Okay, so if I compare German searches uh, to let's say Spanish searches from abroad, okay, we see that when there is a Germany specific shock, these Kölner zones, Spanish searches do not react, but German searches from abroad do. It. Okay, and I can combine all languages and all countries together, and we see that this co movement in searches it, it intensifies during the crisis period. Now, for transmission channels, again, it's maybe a bit too long for me to cover. So let me just again restate that there is evidence for the importance of local diasporas. If you if you live in a region with many co-ethnics, spillover is much stronger. You know, if you are all by yourself, you have no one from your country of origin to talk to. Apparently, that matters a lot for the strength of spillovers. There is also evidence for uh, family transmission and for Facebook ties, okay? But I, I don't have time to talk a lot about this. Important thing is who do you actually learn from, okay? As we were discussing, maybe there are some selection issues that you, for example, move the way of your country and you don't really associate with whatever your government or your country on average things. Like, for example, I disagree with the Russian position on the, on the war in Ukraine strongly, okay? I do not commove with the average Russian attitude currently. But maybe what I do commove with is, for example, what uh, more liberal minded Russia thinks currently. Okay, so let's see. And the European refugee crisis was also a very polarizing event. Okay, so for example, in Austria or Germany, you can see that right leaning and left leaning folks were actually uh, thinking very differently about these events in terms of their opposition to non Europeans. Okay. And what I see is that basically, for example, if I look at the respondents who identify as left-leaning, the largest and the positive spillover coefficient is with the left-leaning origin, not with the right or the center, okay? Same if I look at the education of Muslim, okay? If I, for example, I look at people without higher education, they come off with the origins without higher education, not with uh, highly educated uh, average, okay? Alex, so this could effect... you then conclude, please? Yes, it's basically the last thing. So what it shows basically is that the bulk of the effect comes from like-minded groups. And I show it in more detail in the paper. Uh, then I basically go to other cases, like you know the same-sex marriage laws. I, I saw uh, similar spillovers and so on. But because we are out of time, I will just conclude. So. I think this paper is important because it shows this kind of real time political contagion, okay, from origins to diasporas, to immigrants living elsewhere, okay? Uh, and it also shows where it comes from. It comes from salient events that hit the origins and they basically trigger attention and learning from the origins, okay? It also shows that quite naturally, you know, if migrants integrate more into their destination, then they care less and they, so they basically, Another reason why integrating migrants in the host society is important because they basically receive less of spillovers from abroad. Okay. And it also shows that basically learning is stronger from like minded groups at the origin. All right. It shows that basically, um, why is it important? After all, you know, I think it is important because it extends our understanding of how political attitudes, beliefs, and formed. Okay. It's not only family, it's not only local exposure and networks, it's also the origin, okay? Very distant places that still can matter if you pay attention, okay? It underscores the importance of immigrants integration, okay? And it can show how basically salient event can create this uh, contagious contagion. Okay? This paper is actually part of a larger agenda of like currently three papers that I undertake. And so just if you're interested, stay tuned or shoot me an email. I'm, more than happy to, to talk about this. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much. So this year we have a discussion and um, today it will be Pia Schilling from Free University of Bolzano. Um, if you can share your screen, then the stage is yours for five to 10 minutes. And then we'll open it also to the audience afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
Um, oh yeah. Okay. So thank you, um, Alex, for for the presentation. I hope you can hear me and see me. Otherwise, out. Um, I cannot see, but I can hear. You cannot see my slides. Can the others? I know the slides. I can. Oh no, we can see them. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, this was a really nice paper. Super interesting to read, and I felt like quite something something new. Um, I don't think I need to. Yeah, summarize it. You address the transmission of political opinions via international migration networks, and you have it split a little bit in two parts, where you first focus a little bit on the co-movement, and then you have your different diff focusing on the refugee crisis. And it's a very long paper, so it was difficult to think about things, or I don't really want to suggest any additions because I think you already have a yeah, very full paper and a lot of things. I just thought about some little things that might be interesting to maybe add or, or um, yeah, put in put in with the rest. Um, and one one is, I mean, you say it that the control and also the transi transition group is very different from the group where the refugees actually stay. And I wondered if also the people who live leave from there, so the immigrants from this group, might be different than the people who stay there. Um, and you do the spillovers, um, or first you, yeah, you don't do the spillovers by transmission country versus staying country. And I was wondering if you see if there's differences in how much those spillovers are between those countries. So if maybe the spillovers in the countries where there's only transmission is smaller or bigger, um, if there's anything depending on that. And then I wondered if, um, the distance of the person, the immigrant in another country, if the distance to the average origin opinion in the home country, um, if that matters. So if I'm already very different from the beliefs in my home country, do I behave differently when opinions in my home country change? Um, so if, if I might move differently than the rest of the immigrants that come from there. Um, so just to clarify, these both questions are basically about selection in a sense, right? So how exactly how non-representative you are compared to your origin, right? Yeah, just just an idea of maybe from some countries immigrants are different, but also there might be within those immigrants some people who are moved because of certain differences in opinion from their country. Would right, just be exactly. interesting maybe to to have a look, maybe even if, if there's nothing. Um, and then. Yeah, you use you look at the intensity like for media coverage to see how much a country was affected. But I was also wondering if it might be an, a mechanism, how much was reported in a country. And also, I don't know if you can see the direction of the opinion that was reported in the media, but it might as well be a mechanism then that you can use. Um, That's in my to do list. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, OK. <Yeah. laughs> I don't know. Um, and then. Well, one thing that I wasn't, I think that was a bit confusing because in the paper you have some mechanisms after the co-movement part, and then you have some mechanism after the diff and diff. And I was wondering if you want to put them all together and focus them on the spillovers after the diff and diff. And the, like this, you don't break it up. And like this also, maybe you have, um, yeah, have them a little bit better together. And for, I really like your social media, um, and media usage and online usage to um, to look at the spillovers and your connectedness. And an idea that was, I only Googled quickly, like for example, Poland has had only 20% internet coverage in 2002 compared to I think 80% or 85, I don't remember, but a very high one in 2019. So maybe you can also use that, how much people could actually connect through online media, but also, also through social media. Um, just based on based on technology. Yeah, there is even data for Europe on the share of people on social media, I think. Yeah, but so some uh, might just not even have the opportunity depending on yeah. where they lived or in which country. You probably have a big variation which countries were first in the rollout or were quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that is it's more general. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's a very long paper. You have a very like a lot of different angles, different topics. Um, so sometimes it was a bit difficult to follow. You jump around between different topics. And I think you did a way better job, like in the 
the, the presentation was very clear and you focused more on like the anti-immigrant movement and just showed the other opinions somewhat um, shorter. I think this could be something to consider for the paper to really have one main focus and then a little bit smaller attention to, to the other opinions that you have, just that you don't, don't jump around too much and don't have, um, right, right, uh, right. have it a bit too confused. And then I can send you what I commented in the paper also. Um, you have some oh, parts thanks. that sure. are repetitive and that, that come double or that, that just don't seem necessary where you maybe can condense the paper and make it a little clearer. To read perfect perfect yeah yeah, yeah. but you. very very nice it was really nice to read and super interesting thank you thanks so much yeah should i respond now or after other questions um yeah maybe a very quick response 30 seconds one minute and thank you very much no, Pierre. Okay, and then yeah, we'll yeah. open to the floor because i see there's also martin yeah but quick reply right right no i think there's super useful feedback thanks Thanks so much, P. And sorry, I sent the paper, the last version, pretty late, and it's pretty long indeed. So it's like a heroic effort from your side. And um, thanks a lot for that. And uh, I think the most, from from what I heard, I think the most interesting for me is the selection question that you have at the very beginning. So two things. First, I have origin fixed effects, right? So if there are any fixed things that are different, this is partial out, okay? Also, it's in some specifications, I have, for example, education cross time fixed effects, which means that, for example, if you're concerned that, let's say, uh, imagine all immigrants from Russia are non-educated, okay? And because of this, they react in a certain way to the refugee crisis or to the media coverage of the refugee crisis because they're afraid, let's say, to lose their jobs, okay? If this is the case, this would be captured by basically subgroup cross time fixed effect okay but only if of course the selection is very clear on which dimension it's happening like for example if if only non-educated people leave let's say russia and hungary okay also i drop recent migrants okay to basically make sure that it is not recent selection but then what you said is that maybe maybe there is an interaction effect right that the extent to which you're dissimilar with your country of origin can affect the extent to which you update based on what's happening abroad. This I have not yet checked. This is possible. I think this but is it wasn't important. so much a concern, more maybe something interesting. Who those No, 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 are. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. I think, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, it was one minute, so I could talk more, but yeah. It's, uh, yeah, you can also exchange later. I think now we'll yeah. move to Martin. Um, yeah, thank you. This was really, really cool. I just have a quick question about the interactions or like sort of like whether um, the exposure that you get in, in the country where you are is a substitute or a complement of the exposure that you are getting for your network. So the, say that you are a Hungarian who lives in Italy, right, where norms are deteriorating and in your country are deteriorating, right? So are you uh, going to be influenced by both environments? And say that you are a Hungarian who is in Belgium, right? Where attitudes are yeah, getting yeah. better, right? So there, uh, yeah, it goes in the opposite direction. So I'm just curious about this type of interactions. That's interesting. Yeah, I have not explored the interaction between. So I controlled, okay, for local changes, and they matter, okay. Sometimes even stronger than. It depends actually on whether you are like a citizen locally, let's say, or not. So if you are a recent migrant and not a citizen. You even pay like a stronger or comparably strong attention to destination as compared to local okay to origin sorry as compared to local attitudes if you become citizen okay then you care more about local than origin attitudes okay but what you, you say is that maybe you know if both origin and destination let's say both start hating refugees then maybe it's like you know an accumulated effect or something this i don't know Exactly. That's, that's, I, I was yeah. expecting not a not an interaction there, but actually a, a negative one when norms are changing in the opposite way as you, so that it balances out. Maybe. Yeah. This is something to check for, for me to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Thank you. Is there any other questions, so, please? So uh Please don't be afraid to raise your hands. And uh, meanwhile, to, to bridge the silence, it's not central to your paper, but how do you explain the uh, positive interaction on the education? I, I would have thought that maybe, I would have expected it the other way around. 
kind of yeah so for me it was a, both like integration and you know education and whether you're interested in politics is a story of attention okay so basically how much attention do you pay to foreign events okay if you are you know integrated in your new new country you probably pay less attention okay to events uh back home and this is what we see in the data right but then education and interest in politics were like the opposite side of this so i thought that like okay if you are more educated if you're interested in politics it's like a general thing you know so you're more interested in uh, political social cultural affairs and the spillover is stronger in this case and by the way if i run them together okay then basically they cancel out each other so apparently this you know education goes through interested in politics basically okay but the effect of education is stronger so if you're educated there is like a stronger increase in the spillover coefficient but that's that's how it is but um, for me it was a, like a model of attention in the paper i even have like the model actually outlined but uh, it's not not a rocket science there so yeah but thanks for question every, questions everyone it's it's very nice and uh, very helpful if there are any other please uh, go ahead So I just like one quick thing, like um, I think there's another question. Yeah, I can speak with him another time, so no worries. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say Martin, it's it's fine. No, uh, my question was only if you have done the spillovers on the opposite direction, right? Whether it was possible to see the changes in the destination in the in the hosting society back home, right? Yeah, like if. Yeah, if there is like a change in your new country or among the diaspora, whether it's spillovers back home, basically, right? I think on this, so one, I'm kind of trying to separate the other uh, direction of traffic, right? So what I do is that I limit my sample to those immigrants and second gen immigrants who live in non affected countries, for example, in Portugal or Spain or Russia or Estonia. And what it gives me is that there is no local shock, right? But there is definitely shock of the origin, right? So this basically allows me to see whether it's origin and not a local influence. But then, of course, it's a separate question that maybe, you know, local changes can spill over. And, but I think there are already a few papers that show this, actually. There is a paper on Moldova, for example, that shows, like, how, you know, immigrants from the Moldovan expats from the West, how they affected democratic attitudes back home, uh, and some other papers in this regard. So I think, in principle, there is evidence that this can be happening. But usually it's like not that like it changes abroad to spill over back home, but like just an exposure to a different culture can can get, you know, back 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 home. Uh, in this paper, it's like more an effect of changes on changes. But, uh, but I think it's a totally, totally valid question. Yeah. All right. We have another question by Teresa. So I'm unmuting you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, hi. So it's not a, I mean, directly, directly related, but you, you do uh, interest in politics sort of has a heterogeneous effect. But I was wondering if you could look like at political mobilization as an outcome. Because when you make this certain issue, which is very related to politics, more salient, this might have an effect on political participation or simply on interest in politics by these migrants, both in politics back in the home country and at That's destinations. So whether they like protest, vote, yes, or simply report being interested in politics. In, in politics, first. exactly. So the in political science, I think there is a lot of this uh, where you measure just like if, or political mobilization. Yeah. So if you're uh, intended to vote, or if you maybe start Perfect. having some party, yeah, I can check this. Some yeah, party affiliation. No. So maybe I don't right. know if you could have different outcomes to look, but I think it could also be an interesting thing. Absolutely, and thanks for suggesting this interest in politics things and political activity. What I do have beyond like attention and attitudes and salience is actually voting. Okay, so I can show that, for example, if your country of origin becomes more conservative, and if you are interested in politics, and only in this case, you are more likely to vote for conservative parties locally. Okay? Or I don't know if the survey has, but sometimes they ask if you have no party preference and maybe you just start having a party preference you know i mean i think that there there could be I see. Uh, ways of I looking see. at this well keep in mind it's not a panel okay so it's yeah, just it's a true. group a group is becoming more interested right yeah exactly right, right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> i was thinking in a no, panel no, but still, you could look at it 
yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this German panel, right? This German socioeconomic panel. Exactly. So there it would be possible to check for it. That's the one I'm using. So that's why I was. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. I know. So, yeah. <laughs> Very specifically yeah, yeah, yeah. about this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, cool. Yeah, thanks. I, I can I can try this. Yep.